It's my pleasure to introduce this evening um, Dr. John Mason to give the first of two webinars on Sir Patrick Moore, Early Life Mentors and Notebooks. Um, John was a friend and a colleague of Sir Patrick for 45 years and is a trustee and archivist for the Sir Patrick Moore Heritage Trust. Uh, thank you very much, John. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew. There is no doubt that Sir Patrick Moore was one of the greatest science communicators that the United Kingdom has ever seen. His many books, over 200 radio and TV broadcasts, his numerous lectures established him as a household name and uh, loved by many who saw his many, many presentations. I was fortunate in knowing Patrick for 45 years, as Andrew said, and uh, I'm now a, a, a trustee, an archivist for the Sir Patrick Moore Heritage Trust. Uh, when Patrick died back in December 2012, um, he left an enormous amount of material in his house, uh, notebooks, uh, huge amounts of uh, other books and material, which we have taken many years to go through. And it's interesting to perhaps look and see why it was that this man was the great force in British astronomy that he turned out to be. He was uh, a member of the British Astronomical Association from 1934 until his death in 2012. He served the association in many, many capacities, including president, vice president, director of the Lunar and Mercury and Venus sections, public relations officer, and also meetings recorder. And his contribution to British astronomy um, is, is absolutely incredible. What I want to try and do uh, in this webinar and in the next one is to try and establish what it was that made Patrick the great force that he turned out to be. Patrick was respected by amateurs, both professional and uh, amateur, all over the world. And there was one good reason for this. He knew what he was talking about. And that was very important. It was why he was such a good interviewer and why all the world's top astronomers wanted to be interviewed by Patrick, because they knew that when he interviewed them, the questions that he was going to ask them would be sensible and they would be the ones that people wanted to hear and the ones that they wanted to talk about. His knowledge and expertise was because he, for all of his life, had been an observer, a visual astronomer, a man who'd started out looking with the naked eye, gone through a number of smaller telescopes and binoculars, to eventually the larger telescopes and observatories that we'd have in his garden at his home in Selsey, where his final days were. When Patrick talked about something, he had that air of expertise and knowledge because he had been there. He had spent his whole life looking at the sky. He'd watched and seen so many phenomena over decades. And this meant he had an incredible knowledge base to draw on. In the first of these two webinars, I'm going to go back to Patrick's very early days and take it through from his birth on the 4th of March 1923 up to just before the Second World War. These were Patrick's formative years. And the things that we find when we look at the many pieces of information that we have about his early life is that he was incredibly knowledgeable from an early age and that he was incredibly focused from a very early age. Now, here we have a couple of uh, early pictures, probably the earliest pictures that we have of Patrick when he's probably about four years old. Now, Patrick was born in a house in Pinna in Middlesex, but he didn't stay there very long. Patrick's family was a fairly well-connected one. His father, Captain Charles Trussell Moore, winner of the Military Cross in the First World War, 
and his grandparents on his father's side, William Caldwell Moore, a Scotsman, and his German grandmother, Selina Emily Troschel, who was almost certainly German, although Patrick referred to as, as Swiss for various reasons. On his mother's side, his mother, Gertrude Lillian White, his grandfather, Julius White, his grandmother, Josephine White. Now, they had a large house in Campbell, Camberwell and a holiday home in Bognor Regis. And when Patrick was very, very young, Patrick and his parents were packed off to the grandmother's holiday home in Bognor Regis. And that is where he grew up. Now, his father, Charles Croshall Moore, was, uh, as I say, a, a military uh, cross decorated in the First World War, a disciplined military man. And uh, while we were going through Patrick's things, we found the actual telegram that he received from Buckingham Palace on the 30th of May 1917, summoning him to Buckingham Palace. Your attendance is required at Buckingham Palace on Wednesday next, the 6th of June at 10 o'clock, service dress. Regrets no one except those to be invested can be admitted. So this was the actual telegram where he went to the palace to be awarded his military cross. His mother, Gertrude Lillian White, was uh, very accomplished as a singer, as an artist. She could have been a, a professional opera singer, but she gave up that opportunity to uh, become married and have a family. And she also was a, a very accomplished artist. And you can see this from very early days. And we were very fortunate when we got went through some of Patrick's things that we found a number of her school books. And this is a a beautiful painting, a watercolour that uh, Patrick's mother did of uh, a sprig of holly with berries. And if you go back to some of her school books, and uh, you can see here, this is her part of uh, her biology book. And you can see there, she's got some lovely drawings of uh, various things in her biology books. And here's some flowers that she sketched and seeds as well. So clearly, uh, she had a, a very great artistic bent. And although Patrick would always say he wasn't a great draftsman, he wasn't a great artist, this, I think, was not correct. He had a very good eye. He was a brilliant observer. He would see detail and things that other people might miss. And although he, in his own words, was not necessarily the, the best of astronomical draftsmen, he was able to record what he saw very, very well. And there's undoubtedly undoubtedly some of his mother's skills in that. Now, as I said, very early in uh, Patrick's life, in uh, 1923, uh, they moved from the house in Pinner in Middlesex down to Bognor Regis. And here is the house they moved to, 18 Glencathera Road, Bognor Regis. And uh, in those days, in the early 1920s, Bognor Regis was the sort of Monte Carlo of the south coast of England. And it was a place that uh, writers and artists and poets would go to. It had a very good um, uh, social set and, and scene. And uh, Patrick's mother was certainly part of that. But this is the house where Patrick uh, grew up for the first six years years of his life. In those days, it was just plain Bogner. It wouldn't become Bogner Regis until 1929. And in fact, it was in 1929 that Patrick actually moved away from this address. Now, we have a couple of pictures of uh, the uh, house in Glencathera Road. Here's um, uh, Patrick's mother in the foreground with a very young Patrick there at the bottom and uh, grandmother looking on from the steps of the house. And here we have a couple of pictures of Patrick uh, in the garden uh, around the house. You can see he's sitting in the back garden there in the right hand shot. And in the left hand shot, he's uh, outside looking through the window. Now, I do not think he's actually smoking a cigarette in that picture. It does rather look like it, but I'm pretty sure it isn't. But uh, anyway, there's a couple of pictures of Patrick early on in the house in Glencathera Road. 
Now, this rather lovely view is of Patrick dressed as a fairy. Now, he took place in quite a number of plays uh, when he was quite young, and uh, he was obviously cast as a fairy in this particular play, local production, and uh, as, as uh, in later life, Patrick would not only write his own plays, but during the war, he would write reviews and star in many plays of his own writing, and uh, in later years in life, he would uh, always be in the Christmas pantomime in his hometown of Selsey, where we would always play the Demon King. So there was a bit of a performer in him from the very early times. And of course, it was as a performer that he really became well known on television and as a live performer on stage doing his many, many lectures. So these things, these skills of Patrick were there from an early age. Now, he begot an interest in astronomy at the age of six when his mother bought him this book that he's holding here, The Story of the Solar System by G. F. Chambers. Chambers was a bit like the, the Patrick Moore of the late 19th, early 20th century, in that he wrote a lot of little books about astronomy to try and interest people in the subject. And this book uh, was the one that switched Patrick on to the wonders of the night sky. I myself had a little book that started me off in astronomy, and it was the 1962 edition of the Observer's Book of Astronomy, written by none other than this man, Patrick Moore. It cost half a crown at the time. And that was the little book that set me on my way long before I actually met Patrick, six years before I met Patrick. But uh, nonetheless, small books like this can have an incredible effect. And uh, this little book here was the one that started Patrick on his lifelong passion in astronomy. Now, as I've said, in 1929, Bogner, plain old Bogner, became Bogner Regis. And it was in that year that Patrick and his family moved away from the coast of Sussex inland to East Grinstead. They bought a house in Worsted Lane in East Grinstead. And here is the house. And they called it Glen Cathera after the name of the road in which they'd found the first, the previous six years. Now, it was at this house where Patrick would live from uh, 1929 right the way through to 1965. So for 36 years, this would be Patrick's base. This would be where astronomy would become a major passion of his and also where he would spend the wartime years. Now, Patrick's mother kept her hand in with her painting. And here is um, a, a watercolour that she's done of Patrick with uh, a pair of binoculars there beside him. So this is uh, probably after he'd uh, already got his first pair of binoculars. He started uh, using them to look at the sky. And in later years, Patrick would always recommend that people would get binoculars before they got themselves their first telescope. That's probably because that's exactly what he did at the time. And here, uh, a later view of the in the garden of the uh, house in uh, East Grinstead, Patrick's father there on the left, his mother next to him, and Patrick already taller than his father and mother. And at that stage, he was still only a teenager. Uh, anyone who met Patrick will know that he was a very tall man. Please don't ask me what the small white rabbit is in the lower right corner of the picture. I have absolutely no no idea. Now, near where the house was in Worsted Lane, East Grinstead, there was a large private estate. It was owned by a millionaire businessman by the name of F.J. Hanbury. And he was part of the company Allen and Hanbury, who were a pharmaceutical concern. And uh, on this uh, large estate uh, where um, uh, Hanbury lived, um, he wanted an observatory. 
Now, although he didn't know much about astronomy, he was very interested in astronomy. And as a millionaire businessman, he liked to throw dinner parties. And if you're going to throw dinner parties, it's very nice to be able to say, oh, just come down the bottom of my garden and have a look through my telescope. And so uh, Hanbury uh, realized that if he wanted to set up an observatory in the grounds of his uh, estate there in East Grinstead, he would need his own astronomer. And so he uh, uh, appointed a man by the name of William Sadler Franks to set up this observatory. And it was the Brockhurst Observatory. And it was established in the grounds of Hambury's residence in East Grinstead. And it was only a few hundred yards from where Patrick lived. Now, William Sadler Franks, born in 1851, dying in 1935, was a, a real luminary of the astronomical scene in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I haven't got time to go into all of Hanbury's accomplishments, but uh, although he wasn't an original BAA member, uh, he joined very early after the BAA was formed in 1890, and he became director of the Star Colours section. Now, Hanbury was very interested in the colours of stars. And of course, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, uh, star colours were um, of, of great interest and people were trying to record the colours of stars and trying to classify them according to their colours. And uh, 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 William Sadler Franks would only um, run the BA star colour section for some years, but he also had a lot of notebooks in which he recorded his observations. Now, Franks was an incredibly neat and meticulous observer. He recorded all of his observations in lovely hard bound notebooks with lined pages or lined and plain pages. And he would obviously record all of the observations neatly. He would do his sketches beautifully in these notebooks. And those notebooks were incredibly well organized. And he didn't only write his astronomical observations in those notebooks, he also wrote in notebooks about all the flowers in the garden and the various plants in the garden. Now, Hanbury, F.J. Hanbury, may have been interested in astronomy, although not much of an astronomer, but he was a very keen botanist gardener. In fact, he was a renowned expert on orchids. And uh, William Sadler Franks recorded uh, in notebooks uh, beautiful details of the gardens in Hanbury's grounds and of the plants that grew there. Now, at some stage in the um, early 1930s, uh, after Franks had set up the observatory and was working there for Hanbury, uh, the Moors were invited to supper at Hanbury's residence. And Patrick and William Sadler Franks met. And I think it was clearly uh, going to be an incredibly important point in Patrick's life because W.S. Franks took Patrick under his wing. And you can see in many of the things that Patrick did from then on that he would follow Franks's example. And in this respect, Patrick decided that once he was starting to observe the sky, he would record all of his observations in hard bound notebooks with lined pages. And I have uh, the very first of them here. This is the very first uh, notebook that Patrick had. And I can take you to the very first observation that Patrick ever wrote in any observing book. This is the very first page of the very first observing book on the 3rd of November, 1934. And he's recording what stars were visible. Patrick taught himself the entire night sky, constellation by constellation, Star by star, he learned his way around the sky. And again, he would always recommend to people taking up an interest in astronomy that they follow the same pattern. Learn your way around the sky, 
teach yourself the constellations, the names of the brighter stars, the locations of the brighter star clusters, and then nebulae and galaxies and other objects. So here we have uh, that record for the very first time that Patrick wrote in one of the notebooks. You can see he's talking about which stars and which constellations are visible. And he's noted that uh, the planet uh, Uranus is, uh, is visible there. And uh, there's various other things. So let's have a look at the next page. This is the 8th, 13th and the 19th of November. So this is the second page of that notebook. He's also recording that he can see Saturn as well there and uh, the names of various stars. So these were the first attempts of Patrick to note down what he saw. He was always of the view that observations were important and they should be recorded and written down, not only so one could see one's own progression through time, but also that one could go back and look at what one had observed and maybe see things that one hadn't noticed previously. Now, also in November 1934, Patrick joins the British Astronomical Association. He's only 11 years old. And here is the very letter dated the uh, uh, 28th of November 1934 from Sellers, the secretary at the time. Uh, and uh, you can see here it's a, a standard letter in which they are writing to Patrick and saying that uh, he's uh, being elected a member and he's got to remit his membership of 26 shillings, which is the entrance fee, five shillings and the subscription of one pound, one shilling. In other words, a guinea was the annual subscription and the entrance fee was five shillings, 25 pence in new money. So that's a start of a, a, a association between Patrick and the BIA that would go on from 1934 until his death in 2012. So November 1934 is when it all began. Now, just, there we go. Now this is um, in January 1935. Uh, it's in the same notebook. And this is as far as we know, bottom left there, the very first sketch of the moon that Patrick made. Uh, I think it's only made with binoculars or the naked eye, but uh, it's the very first sketch of the moon that we can find in any of his notebooks. And on the right hand side, another important first. Not only has he started to sketch the moon, but he's also started to observe stars that vary in brightness. And you can see on the right hand side there on the 25th of um, January, he's observing uh, a number of uh, stars that are either variable or suspected of variability. And notice that one of them is the star Betelgeuse. Now Betelgeuse is the orange red supergiant star in the top left of Orion the Hunter as we look at it. It marks Orion's right armpit. And uh, that star was very much in the news at the end of this uh, last year and beginning of this because Betelgeuse faded quite dramatically over a few months between October and February. Uh, it's now recovering its uh, normal brightness again. But I know that if Patrick had been alive at the end of 2019 and early 2020, he would have been fascinated by that fading of Betelgeuse because here he's been observing it since 1934. And uh, in the next webinar, I will show you some later observations of Betelgeuse that Patrick made during the war time years. Now, Patrick's first telescope was uh, this one. It's a uh, three uh, inch, or I think three and an eighth inch Broadhurst Clarkson refractor. And uh, you can see it's mounted on uh, a tripod with a pillar and then the telescope. Now, the pillar was not very stable, so Patrick soon uh, modified that to make the telescope uh, not be on the pillar, but be slightly more stable. And uh, that was the telescope with which he made many 
of his first telescopic observations. But of course, he also had use of the observatory at the Brockhurst Observatory on F.J. Hanbury's estate under the tutelage of William Sadler Franks. And certainly up until Franks's death in 1935, uh, uh, May, um, basically Patrick would often pop round and observe with Franks. But even with his own telescope, he started to make observations of the moon and planets. It would be the moon and planets that would be Patrick's great love throughout his life. And uh, if we can see here, these are the first uh, drawings. These are from uh, in 1935. We have some, uh, this is in May 1935, around the time of Franks's death. Um, and you can see there that um, he's observed Mars and Jupiter and uh, Venus and the crescent moon. And also he's projected the sun onto a piece of white card and he's attempted his first drawings of sunspots. Again, you can see the meticulous way in which he records everything that he sees. He records the observing conditions. Is the air steady or is it rather turbulent? Is it rather misty and murky or is it very transparent? And he also records the details that he can see. So we have here the observations there, the beginning observations, his first observations of Mars and Jupiter and Venus, and also the beginning of solar observations. Now, what is interesting is that in later life, people would obviously say that Patrick was an observer of the moon and planets primarily. But in these early days, the object which he looked at, perhaps more than any, was the sun. And he would observe the sun whenever it was clear. He would project the image from his telescope onto a piece of white card and he would sketch the sunspots that he saw. Now, in those days, there was a rather complicated method of uh, categorizing and cataloging sunspots. And here you can see um, a, uh, an excerpt from Patrick's sunspot log. And you can see he's recording the date the time. You can see he's made observations there on six consecutive days and uh, he's recorded the number of spots he's seen, he's uh, described the spots and made notes about them. And uh, certainly in these days, in the 1930s, Patrick was probably observing the sun more than any other single object. Here we have Venus. Now, Venus, of course, is beautifully placed in the evening sky at the moment. And uh, it's uh, very, very bright. You can see it as soon as the sky gets dark. And in 1935, there was an evening elongation of Venus. And uh, here you can see he's using his uh, three and one eighth inch refracting telescope, the one I showed you the picture of. And he's basically recording uh, the observations, the shadings. He's seeing dusky shadings on the planet's disk. And he's also making his first sketches of the planet. So you've got uh, some later observations of the uh, 1935 apparition uh, here. You can see we've got the uh, uh, planet there. You can see the sketches. They don't show a lot of detail, but uh, just a few dusky shadings. And also here we have just a few notes on the elongations of 1939 and 1941. And uh, you may say, well, Patrick hasn't made many observations, and that, of course, because the war had intervened. This is Patrick's uh, picture of him standing beside the Brockhurst Observatory. Franks unfortunately died in a rather tragic cycling accident in 1935. And not long after that, in 1936, F.J. Hanbury approached the young Patrick and asked him if he would be willing to do what Franks had done, and that is to show people round his observatory when he had dinner parties and guests at his estate. And Patrick, of course, very gladly agreed to do it. And as he said, 
not many people become a director of an observatory, particularly at the age of 13 years old. And so there he is in charge of the Brockhurst Observatory with that wonderful sixth and one eighth inch Cook refractor with which Patrick made a number of observations. And he would, of course, uh, show people objects through the telescopes whenever Hanbury asked him. So uh, we see uh, another uh, lovely example of Patrick at quite an early age, getting quite a lot of responsibility, being responsible for what would have been a large and expensive telescope to operate. Here we have one of uh, Patrick's uh, sunspot full disc drawings made about that time. And again, you can see he's sketching the spots. He's showing the individual spots and the components of the different active areas and sunspot groups. In 1936, there was a partial eclipse of the sun. It began very early in the morning. It's only two days before the summer solstice, as you can see. And uh, Patrick has done a series of sketches of the partially eclipsed sun. You can see it looks like someone's taken a bite out the sun, but there is the dark disk of the new moon moving across the top of the sun from left to right, recorded by Patrick, noting the times at which he made the observations. So this is, as far as we know, uh, the first uh, solar eclipse that Patrick recorded um, at that time. Now, this was something rather interesting that we found when we were going through Patrick's effects at his house after his death. A planisphere is um, a lovely tool by which you can work out which stars and constellations will be visible at any time of night, at any time of the year. You rotate one dial inside the outer dial and you line up the month and the time and it will tell you what stars are visible. And here we can see it's lined up for about 10.30 p.m. in the middle of June. And you can see that uh, we have the uh, stars of the Summer Triangle uh, in Deneb, Vega and Altair over to the left hand side there. They're coming up in the southeastern sky and uh, over in the uh, west we have Leo and Virgo going down. Patrick made this himself out of cardboard and paper. He annotated it all himself and uh, it's fixed by a paper fastener in the middle. And it just shows how incredibly clean he was to make things himself. Um, he would uh, bind many of the uh, books and things. He would often, instead of buying books, he would type out a book because it helped him to become a fast typist. And then he would bind the books himself. And uh, so he was very practical in doing things like that. So there's a planisphere made by Patrick in 1937. Now, this general diary of observations uh, from the Brockhurst Observatory and for his own uh, observations made from the house in East Grinstead uh, shows Patrick's incredible attention to detail. I'll talk more about this notebook in the second webinar, but you can see there he records the detail of the uh, telescopes that he's using, uh, the big equatorial, the six and one eighth inch Cook refractor with all the eyepieces and powers and his own small three inch Broadhurst Clarkson with the various um, uh, eyepieces that he's using. So again, a great attention to detail. And uh, in these uh, books, these general observing books, here we're looking at uh, Mars. This is his first recorded observations of Mars. Now, we do have some sketches of Mars in the earlier book, but they're not made with the, uh, the telescope. And you can see here that he's got uh, the oppositions of 1935, 1937, and uh, a little bit of a, a sketches on the right hand. He's not seeing a great deal of detail with the three inch telescope there, but he's learning his craft. He's beginning to learn the discipline and the practice of looking through a telescope and converting what you see through the eyepiece to what you draw on paper. And yes, these sketches may be crude by his later examples, but they are nonetheless showing his attention to detail and his keenness to get 
things right and to follow the example of William Sadler Franks, recording everything meticulously in notebooks and also to an extent his mother's skills in sketching things as she saw them. Here we can see some uh, other views of Mars uh, done in 1939. Uh, this is just after the outbreak of the Second World War. You can see there with the, some of the surface markings shown in those drawings. Jupiter, he's obviously not able to see a, a great deal, um, but uh, this is with the, uh, the large telescope in the Brockhurst Observatory. Notice he's using a very high power there of times 325 on the, uh, the large Cook refractor, but uh, he's only just beginning to learn about recording detail on Jupiter. These are the first observations where he attempts to sketch the stripy cloud belts and some of the other features that you see in the planet's atmosphere. Again, they are very crude by his later standards, but he was learning the discipline and craft of looking at something through a telescope. And when you see Jupiter through a large telescope under high power, there is an enormous wealth of detail to record, it can be rather daunting. And that Patrick was trying at this early age, and remember, he's only 16 years old, it shows a great attention to detail and a, a, a willingness to learn the skills that would set him up for the rest of his observing life. And I'm going to finish this webinar with a picture of Patrick taken in 1939. This was taken apparently on the 8th of May 1939. It shows Patrick as a 16 year old looking uh, very smart there. And uh, that is leading us up to the outbreak of the Second World War in September of that year. And that's where I will end this webinar. And uh, we, uh, can, I think, can take some questions. I think, Andrew, if you can guide yeah. me through that process, I'll be very happy to do so. Sure, John. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Very interesting. Um, for, pre for questions, can we ask if people use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen? I see we've got one question already. And um, we might also be able to take um, verbal questions if people want to ask anything by raising a hand, but we'll start off with the Q&A at the bottom. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, you should see um, a Q&A icon, which you can click on to ask your questions. Um, the first question is from uh, Naz Balouch. Excuse me if my uh, pronunciation isn't quite right. And he's asked, what happened to Sir, Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick's diaries after his death? Well, Thank you, Naz. That's an interesting question. Basically, he didn't keep diaries like personal diaries, but his observing notebooks are really like diaries, but they obviously detail mainly his astronomical observations. And certainly all through the war, he kept an almost daily log of what he was doing. And although it's mostly about his observations, um, there is a lot of other things in there as well. And I'll certainly deal with that in the next webinar. But after Patrick died, um, all of his observing notebooks um, went to the National Archive of the Science Museum. Now, this was Patrick's wish uh, in his will. He said he wanted his notebooks to become part of the National Archive, and that is where they are. But before um, they went to the Science Museum National Archive, um, the very kind people in the West Sussex County Record Office uh, scanned all of the pages of those observing books. And um, so it is possible to, uh, to uh, look at all of the pages and all of that material. Um, the other interesting thing is, of course, that since Patrick died and all of the things in his house were dispersed, uh, all of the really important things went to the National Archive in the Science Museum, but there was an awful lot of other material that was boxed up, and a lot of it ended up in the South Downs Planetarium in Chichester. And over the years, we have been going through those boxes, and we found a lot of very interesting things, and we're still finding 
interesting things. For example, that planisphere that I showed in the talk here, we found that interleaved in the pages of a book among the thousands of books that um, we, we, we found and we brought back to the planetarium. So uh, although the notebooks themselves are in the National Archive at the Science Museum at Rawton, um, the scans of those notebooks are all uh, in the West Sussex County Record Office. So the next question from Alexander Wilson, what kind of schooling did he have? Now, Patrick did not spend a great deal of time at prep school when he was young. He was a rather sickly child and he was largely home taught. Uh, these days, uh, it's become uh, uh, quite common for people to be homeschooled. In those days, it wasn't quite so common. But Patrick was effectively homeschooled, but he also did do a great deal of work on his own. He was an avid reader of books, uh, not only about astronomy, but also about history and about mythology. Uh, and also, as I said earlier, he would often read books and then type the entire book out and then bind the book himself. And the very process of typing it out was the fact that, uh, uh, you know, it would help him to learn it. Question here from uh, Mick Sigma. Was there a reason for the monocle instead of glasses? <clears throat> When he um, had his eyes tested uh, earlier on in life, he had one uh, very good uh, eye and one that needed glasses. <clears throat> and so he either had a pair of spectacles with a plain glass in one lens or um, and an ordinary a correcting lens in the other, or he would wear a monocle. And Patrick being Patrick, being the eccentric, the lovable eccentric he was, decided he would have a monocle. And he had it for all of his life. And uh, it, that the reason was that uh, in early life, he only uh, needed uh, only uh, uh, correction in one eye. In later life, he did need correction in two eyes and he did have spectacles, but he always had the monocle. It was part of his character, if you like. And, uh, and now, John, yes, uh, if you don't mind, I might just stop your um, screen share because we've got a big black screen at the moment and then you can become full screen on the uh, if that's good with you. Yeah, will I still be able to see the questions and read them. Yes. So if I go there. OK. And you're still good at reading the questions? Yeah, so, so from Richard and Melissa here, do you think there's still a place and opportunity for amateur backyard observers to contribute to the body of knowledge given the technology now in use? Absolutely, yes. The thing is, yes, astronomy has become a very high tech occupation and amateurs are now using equipment that would have been unthinkable even 20 years ago. And the modern amateur can be as well tooled up, as you like, as the professional astronomer of a quarter of a century ago. But there is no doubt that the amateur today has as big a place to play as always the case. They may not be as much a visual observer as Patrick was, but there is still a place for the visual observer. And uh, there are many, many aspects of astronomy where amateurs make a major contributions, the discovery of comets, the observations of meteors, uh, observations of variable stars, deep sky objects, uh, uh, observations of the sun, of course, uh, aurorae, noctilucent out. There's a huge, huge range of things that the amateur astronomer can do. And the British Astronomical Association is the place to go if you want to become an amateur observer. How did I meet Sir Patrick? That's another question from Naz. Um, I um, was very fortunate in that, um, though I did meet Patrick briefly at a lecture he gave when I was uh, quite young, I, I met him um, when I was uh, 14 years old, when he was lucky, I was lucky that he moved to Selsey. Now, uh, in, the in the course of this, I've said that Patrick, of course, uh, lived in East Grinstead from 1929 to 1965. He then spent uh, three years in Northern Ireland, in Armagh, 
And then he came back from Armagh and moved to Selsey, to his beloved Farthings, his house in Selsey. Uh, and when I was uh, 14 years old, Patrick moved to Selsey in the summer of 1968. And the autumn of that year, um, I was lucky enough to go down to his house and to meet him. And uh, over the years, we became good friends. And uh, you would just uh, phone Patrick up. And to one's amazement, he would answer the phone himself. And uh, he, he was a very approachable person. And uh, you would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, can, can I come and look through your telescope? And Patrick's door was always open. And that's one of the amazing things. And now from uh, David Arditi, uh, one of our section directors, what has happened to Patrick's telescopes? Now, the um, eight, the, uh, the uh, eight inch uh, telescope uh, was, um, uh, I think, taken by uh, Bruce Kingsley uh, some time uh, ago. Uh, and when he died, there were the um, uh, 12 and uh, there was the 12 and a half inch Altazimuth Newtonian, and he nicknamed Oscar that he got in about 1950. The 15 and a half inch Newtonian that he obtained from Phil Ringsdor, a uh, former director of the BA Lunar Section, and a five inch Cook refractor. Now, the 12 and a half inch Altazimuth reflector, Oscar, went to the uh, Science Museum and uh, they are apparently going to uh, re restore it. The 15 inch Newtonian and the five inch Cook, uh, they were in a fairly poor state of repair. The optics of both of those telescopes are um, at the planetarium and uh, all of the uh, parts of the tubes and the observatories were photographed before they were demolished. Uh, they, the garden had to be cleared because the house was uh, eventually sold. And uh, as a result, um, all of those parts of the 15 inch and five inch um, are um, at the planetarium. And the hope is that in a walled garden next to the planetarium, we will place those telescopes and hopefully be able to use them. The five inch cook in particular, we'd like to use for um, solar observation. Uh, and now a question from James Dawson. Now, thank you, James, for the comment there. Did Patrick ever make telescopes? <laughs> well, uh, no, he didn't. Uh, and the answer is because Patrick was born with um, not very good DIY skills. Now, those of us who knew Patrick well would know that he had incredible skills, but DIY wasn't one of them. I once went round to Patrick's house where he proudly showed me his latest bit of DIY, where he'd put a tin opener up on the wall. One of these wall mounted ones, you turn the handle and open the can. Unfortunately, he'd mounted it on the wall upside down. So uh, my first job was to uh, actually take it off the wall and mount it the right way up. So no, he didn't actually, uh, he didn't actually make telescopes of his own. So a question from Tim Milton. Have Patrick's telescopes been sold? Uh, uh, oh, no. What has the house been sold and what happened to the telescopes and observatory buildings? The, the situation was that the house farthings was in a uh, fairly poor state when Patrick died. And uh, there was a, a, a plan to, at one stage, to possibly try and talk, turn it into a museum. But it required an enormous amount of investment just to get the house in the state where it will be safe enough for people to go around. And as often happens with these things, the longer time goes on, um, the more memories fade. And so it was decided that the house would be sold and all of the things of Patrick's would either be deposited in the National Archive of the Science Museum or they would come to the planetarium in Chichester. And uh, of course, uh, that, that was Patrick's great love in his uh, later years. Um, he helped set up the planetarium in 2002 and uh, was a great supporter of it. And we have uh, always uh, tried to uh, uh, keep Patrick's memory alive. We, in fact, have 
the waxwork that was in uh, Madame Tussauds in Baker Street um, uh, in the entrance of the planetarium lobby. So um, the house has been sold. It's now owned by a lovely couple who um, want to uh, keep Patrick's memory alive. We have a lovely blue plaque on the wall, which says uh, that it was home to Patrick from 1968 until the end of his life in 2012. Pippa asks, where did Patrick develop his love of music? This is almost certainly from his mother. As I said, Patrick's mother was originally going to become an opera singer, and she was a, a very fine singer. And uh, certainly they had a piano in their house from very, very early on. And Patrick learned to play the piano from a very young age, and he was composing music from a young age. And uh, he, of course, uh, had a great love of music, although um, he would often say that his uh, music love began, uh, belonged more to the 19th century than it did to the 20th century. He was a great lover of waltzes and polkas and music like that. And he, of course, wrote a lot of his own music. And you can get a CD of all of Patrick's music. So it was his mother who basically got his music love going. And uh, he uh, had uh, the use of the piano in the house. And later on, uh, he would get a, uh, a glockenspiel and eventually, of course, course, become a percussionist. He was a very fine drummer. He was a very fine player of the xylophone. And now from John Axtell, who went to Glen Cathro a couple of times when he was a young lad in the mid 50s. Um, uh, Debbie years used to get a card. Uh, right now, you mentioned about the um, uh, Patrick's mother, as I said, was a very fine artist. In later life, every Christmas, she would do a Christmas card. And uh, these cards were of uh, rather bizarre aliens on strange worlds. And they were really great fun. Um, many of us have kept the Christmas cards that Patrick sent. But all around Patrick's house were the originals of those paintings. And uh, those paintings, a lot of them, uh, went to the uh, National Archive. I don't think they took them all. I think one or two of them uh, may have been bought at auction. But there isn't a pristine set of those paintings preserved within the documents that we have. Uh, as I say, there are some of them in the National Archive and some of them are in private hands now. But they really were uh, great fun. How many books did Patrick write and what was the first title from Rob? Well, this is an interesting one because Patrick wrote well over 200 books and many of them went to many, many editions. Um, his first official books were in the very early 1950s when he wrote Guide to the Moon and Guide to the Planets. But he also wrote uh, a lot of uh, other books in those early days about all sorts of things. Uh, he wrote books about the earth. He wrote books about cartography. He wrote books about geology. He wrote all sorts of interesting books in his life. But it was in the early 50s he wrote the first books. But actually, the very first book that Patrick wrote isn't any of those. The very first book that Patrick wrote, he wrote in the 1930s when he first developed his love of astronomy. And it was in about 1936, when he was 13, that he wrote a little book on astronomy for his mother. And the idea was so that she would be able to read it and she would understand what he was talking about. Now, that was a book that he typed himself, but he bound himself. And that, as far as I know, is in the Science Museum National Archive. But that really is the first book that Patrick wrote. There was only one copy ever made. It was given to his mother as a present, and he typed it and bound it himself. So, uh, again, from Martin Filzak, any signs in Patrick's early life of his love of playing, composing music? Absolutely, yes. From a very early age, Patrick was playing the piano and he was composing his own tunes. And although he never learned music formally, 
he was what he himself called a tunesmith. And as a tunesmith, he could basically listen to a tune and remember it and play it. And he taught himself how to write music. He had something which is called perfect pitch. He could hear a piece of music, he could remember it, he could write it down. So this was obviously a great gift. This was something that he obviously was born with, something that was nurtured by his mother, I'm quite sure. And the fact that there was uh, a piano in the house um, and uh, they, Patrick was able to use it. So from Steve Harvey, have we managed to save Patrick's library of books? I imagine it would have been quite extensive. Yes, it was. Uh, when Patrick died, there were books in just about every room of the house. Many, many thousands of um, uh, books. And uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of those uh, books that are not of value in the sense that Patrick owned them, but they are not of any particular significance, those books um, have been uh, disposed of. They've been uh, given to charity shops and some people have got them. The really important works have been um, uh, taken by the National Archive, by the Science Museum. They went through the whole house with a fine tooth comb after Patrick died, and they basically took away all the ones that were of, they considered of great significance for the, um, uh, for the National Archive. Um, that still leaves uh, several thousand others, which we boxed up and took to the planetarium in Chichester. And we've had a number of volunteers over the years, slowly going through them, pulling out some that are of interest. Now, in some cases, Patrick wrote reviews of these books, and the review is in the book. And uh, sometimes he's got books sent to him by famous people, people like Arthur C. Clarke, Carl Sagan, and others. Uh, and again, many of those books went to the uh, Science Museum National Archive. But uh, we tried to preserve as much of the important works as we could. And as I say, there are many of them that we have at the planetarium, and we are trying to make a collection of all the books that Patrick himself wrote and edited. So um, how did Patrick become Games Master? Now, this is an interesting one, again from Naz. Now, Patrick's dislike and distrust of computers was well known. He knew absolutely nothing about the games that he was talking about. But ITV approached him to do the Games Master series. It didn't conflict with any of his astronomy uh, work that he did with the BBC, so he agreed to do it. And uh, basically, he was reading a script. And uh, he was basically going through the script. And as he would say to me very often, I haven't the foggiest idea what they're talking about. So uh, it was basically one of those things. He was a household name, of course. He'd appeared on many of the daytime TV programs, many of the evening quiz programs. He was incredibly well known. He'd appeared with Morecambe and Wise, the Royal Variety performance. And as a result, um, he was wanted and uh, they wanted him to front Games Master. And that introduced him to a whole new generation of computer games people who watch Games Master. So from Gary, Patrick was known to astronomers around the world. How many countries did the sky at night reach? It certainly reached all the English speaking countries in the world. And there were many other places which were not so much necessarily English speaking, but where they did have access to the BBC. And uh, because the BBC is received by countries all around the world, uh, even those which are not mainly English speaking, but have English speakers, um, it was seen. I don't know how many countries, but certainly I know, having travelled around the world with Patrick, that there would be many occasions where Patrick would be sitting, minding his own business in a street side cafe, having a glass of wine, and someone would come up to him and say, are you Patrick Moore? 
may I have your autograph? So his reach extended well beyond the United Kingdom. And that's because, of course, the BBC is known um, all around the world. And the sky at night was watched around the world. Uh, from Steve, are any of his possessions on display in the Science Museum? Not as far as I know at present. Um, the possessions that I mentioned that are in the National Archive are in storage in Rawton. And I believe you can uh, make an application whereby you can actually ask to go and see uh, the things that they have. Uh, but as I say, as far as his notebooks are concerned, uh, we're very fortunate in that all the notebooks were scanned by the West Sussex County Record Office. And uh, you can actually uh, go to Chichester and uh, see those uh, uh, scans uh, or you can request them. Uh, Patrick's musical instruments, David Arditi again. Yes, I can tell you what happened to them. Uh, a, young, uh, a young man by the name of Chris Beaumont uh, was taken under Patrick's wing and uh, he learned the xylophone and he has been going around for some years now playing Patrick's music. So a lot of Patrick's xylophones uh, went to Chris. Uh, the piano, I believe, was sold at auction. I don't know uh, where that went, but nearly all of the percussion, the xylophones, the glockenspiel, etc., went to Chris Beaumont, and he is making incredibly good use of them, performing Patrick's music live and doing an incredibly good job of it, I might say. Any other questions there, Andrew? Um that looks like it's it for now. So unless any, oh, I see someone's put up on chat. Um, well, you could perhaps, I don't know what that is, but uh, it might be of interest yeah. to know. Yeah, I can just read out. It's from uh, Malcolm Porter. Hello, Malcolm. Not a, quest not a question, but just to let you know, I have amongst a number of items I bought at the auction, I have four framed paintings signed by Patrick's mother, including one of the observatory of East, East, East Greenstead. Ah, oh, the, the one I showed, in fact. Yeah, oh. because the, the one I showed, the observatory at East Grinstead, was painted by Mrs Moore. So that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And all have pride of place on his stairs. Oh, wonderful. And if you wish to see them, he'll be in Pagham, hopefully later this year. Oh, I would, I would very much like to make contact. Please get in touch with me. And as question come up, what do I miss mo most about Patrick? His incredible sense of humour and his incredible love of life. And uh, that's the thing I miss most. He had the most amazing sense of humour, his incredible practical joker, and uh, he would often uh, make fun of himself and uh, he wasn't afraid to uh, make practical jokes. And uh, that's that's good. And a letter from uh, and one from Philip Jennings about Patrick's cat. I I am not sure about. I think I know that Patrick's beloved genie passed away uh, a long time ago. But Ptolemy, the black cat, I hope is still with us up north. I believe he's 